Well, good morning. Welcome. Uh, we're glad to have you on our Labor Day weekend. As you can tell, some of our folks are enjoying the last uh, respite before the busy fall calendar, and so we will rejoice with them as they get some rest. Hopefully some good time with family and friends. Always an opportunity to be a good influence there. Moms, this Wednesday at 10 a.m. downstairs, child care is provided for a study there. If you have any questions, you can talk to Becky. But I think most of you know uh, the, the, the format there. But I just want to emphasize this. We used to kind of generally call it young moms, but we're just kind of saying moms. Just come. Uh, moms of any age. Uh, if you're free, 10 o'clock on Wednesday, um, share how God can help you all together in your journey of motherhood. Also for the Women of Grace, for all the women, next Monday, so a week from Labor Day, September 11th at 7 p.m., uh, a simple study of Psalm 63 at Catherine Moorhead's home. This is just an occasional gathering, not on the regular monthly calendar, but just, hey, you might not make it during the day for some of the other studies. Come and just share in the fellowship around the word there uh, next Monday night, and you can see those details in the bulletin, including the address. Uh, if you would like to be baptized, I want to work through the little baptism booklet with you. If you could see me after the service, we want to get that scheduled, uh, talk through baptism to make sure you understand that, and then get you out in the front yard before the weather gets too cold, all right? Uh, so talk to me right after the service if you would like to be baptized. Uh, two weeks from yesterday, there'll be that music concert that was announced in the bulletin at Liberty Hills Bible Church, just up north of the river. Uh, Andrew Peterson, whose song, Is He Worthy?, we sang just a few weeks ago. His daughter is also a songwriter that collaborates with uh, some of the folks that write a lot of the songs that we're singing. Um, and so follow along in those details. Um, and also, uh, Sky Peterson, Andrew Peterson's daughter, uh, will... Uh, be singing here with us. She'll be worshiping with us on the 17th. The children are going to sing a special song with her that she has written. So you are practicing after the service this week and next, all right, downstairs. Most of you were down there last week. Grab your friends right after the service. Uh, there's usually a lot of grabbing of friends after the service anyway. Uh, do it constructively this time uh, and head downstairs to the, uh, the room there and you'll sing through your song. Uh, pray for Jim Tolliver. Uh, you hopefully got that word last night. He's still in the hospital. They're trying to figure out uh, why he has all these pre-open heart surgery symptoms that were resolved by that surgery and then immediately uh, this past weekend, it was last Sunday at church, he really started feeling bad. All the same symptoms, pressure in the chest, trouble breathing, trouble in his left arm. Uh, so they're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, just pray. There's a lot of discouragement, especially after open heart surgery and now feeling all those effects again. Uh, Jim and Cindy need our prayers. And so pray and then reach out and encourage as the Lord leads you. Uh, I wasn't aware, so I didn't mention, but Nathan Shelp, uh, you've met his parents and maybe some of you have met Nathan. Uh, was it just last Sunday or was it two Sundays ago you all were engaged? Two Sundays ago, so Nathan and Holly, if you haven't met them, they are recently engaged, uh, so you can be praying for them uh, as they embark on this journey towards marriage. Yeah, I see some of you wanting to clap. Go ahead and clap for Nathan and Holly. Uh, you're saying, I, you're looking at them saying, I don't know those people. Well, let's do something about that, all right? Uh, Now's your opportunity, and, and you can share your marriage story with them and how God's led you through however many years that's been for you. Uh, so fill up their calendar, all right, with uh, lots of wisdom and fellowship. All right, uh, there's probably more going on in the life of the body because there's something going on in your life, and we may not know about it, but uh, today is a good day to share that with someone. Let us bear those burdens or share in the joy that's going on in your life. Uh, this is why God has put us together as the church. Let's turn our attention now to worship. From Psalm 10, verses 16 and 17, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline their ear. 
And we praise God for this, being the God who does strengthen the afflicted and who does listen and care for his own people. So let's go to him with praise this morning, Father. We do come to you this morning praising you for being the great God of creation who identifies with our weaknesses, even identifies with the temptations, the things that this life brings along. We praise you for being the God who takes sadness and sorrow, turns it into glory and joy, happy tears, the God who saves heathens, the God who provides all that we need, the God who blesses us beyond what we ever could possibly deserve, even as your people, having been declared righteous, you continue to give gifts beyond and above the salvation that comes at death. We praise you as the God who has defeated death, the God who will ultimately end it one day so that death will have no shadow hanging over us. We praise you, Father, for being the one who planned our salvation, for your Son who carried it out, and for the earnest of our inheritance, your Spirit who dwells with and within us. So, Father, be pleased with the the voices of your people this morning as we sing and worship and hear your word. I pray that you'll continue to do your work in our hearts. I pray that we'll be changed and different because of the word that we hear preached this morning. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so let's stand to sing by faith. We will walk by faith.
Good morning, Acts 14. As we hear Dr. Luke's account of Paul and Barnabas visiting a soon-to-be young protege, Timothy, in Lystra. Acts 14, verse 1. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue to, and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities in Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him, and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said to him in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of, priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garland to the gate and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowd. But the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, and they tore their garments and they rushed out to the crowd crying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely retained the people from offering sacrifices to them. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. And now he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they remained no little time with the disciples. Let's go to the Lord in confession. As we think on this text, Heavenly Father, we confess that we have neglected our calling as witnesses. We confess that we have forgotten the kind of power that can raise the lame to walk again. We confess our timidity in the face of opposition to truth claims to Bible claims. And so we have failed to do 
what you have called us to do in spreading this good news. Forgive our selfishness in consuming this good news, in basking in it every Sunday morning as we celebrate in song and word this gospel and then failing to share that. May we, like those leprous beggars in the Old Testament who encountered the wealth of the abandoned armies, recognize the sin that is ours in not sharing such bounty, such gospel. And so use your word this morning to embolden us, to overwhelm us with such joy at being raised to newness of life in Christ that we cannot help but speak of the power that raised us. And should we face opposition in any way, may we realize that the gospel is worth that conflict and its consequence. Lord, give us a love for you that cannot be quenched by any trial or any suffering. Do all this by your spirit, through your word this morning in our lives, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. In 1 John, we read, this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus is the satisfaction of the wrath of God for our sins love demonstrated. Let's stand and sing of this great love.
As you take your order of worship, we'll this morning be looking at our affirmation of faith. We'll be focusing on God's providence this morning in the face of opposition with different excerpts from different psalms. And I'll begin reading, and then the congregation can read the text that's printed there in bold. <clears throat> Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. My God, in his steadfast love, will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. Deliver me from my enemies, O Lord. I have pledged to you for right. Let's come to the Lord together, bringing our petitions before him. Our gracious Lord, you are our omnipotent provider and our protector. You lead us when our way is uncertain. You lead us beside still waters. You restore our soul. You deliver us from evil. You are our refuge and our strength. You are the director of the affairs of the world. All peoples are in your hands. This morning we pray for the peoples of Cambodia, of Laos, Ghana. You would use the efforts of our missionaries to further the reach of the gospel to those people that your word would spread to those in Alaska that are being ministered to by the Schraders. We ask for our nation that your spirit would move across our land, that the truth of the gospel would penetrate the darkness in our land, that righteousness would fail here. We pray you would use the preaching of your word as it goes forth today in pulpits across this land and across the world that your spirit would take the word and use it in the hearts and lives of men and women, children, to show them the truths of Christ, what he has done, to convict them of sin, to bring new life, to bring faith, and to bring many sons to glory. For our prayer is that the gospel would prevail in all places, and your word promises that to be true. Lord, we bring before you petitions of our peoples here. We think of Jim Tolliver in the hospital. Pray you would strengthen him, give the doctors wisdom as they seek to understand why he's still having pains in his chest. Pray for Cindy. She would come to you as her refuge. She would hide herself in your comfort as they face uncertain days ahead. And Lord, we pray for the many others here who have needs not mentioned, but every bit is real. Give us, Lord, faith to follow you, to trust you, knowing that you are a God who does good for your people. Sometimes you ordain suffering for us. We don't always understand why, but we trust you to lead us through it. We trust you to provide refuge, to provide provision. We're thankful that you, our God, are our resting place. For you are the eternal and powerful God. There is none else we can trust but you alone. We pray this morning as your word comes before us, as our pastor brings it to us, give him wisdom, fill him with your spirit. We pray your spirit would be active in our hearts, turning our hearts to Christ, showing us again the fullness of his provision for us. 
Use us, shape us, mold us into his image for his glory. For you pray in his name. Amen. Our Savior is our sure and steady anchor. Let's stand again as we sing. chapter 14. The kingdom is advancing. That's the study of Acts. We're trying to learn portion by portion what lessons would be good for us as a church in understanding this advancing kingdom. And what we find from last week and into this week's chapter is a troubling pattern emerging in the text. It began the end of the last chapter Verse 50 of chapter 13, the Jews incited a riot. They stirred up persecution and drove them out of their district. Well, then you heard at the beginning of chapter 14, as they came into a new region, verse 5, an attempt was made to mistreat them and to stone them. So not only persecution in the sense of driving them out, but threatenings and possibility of even physical violence. But then that culminates in our chapter in verse 19, where the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium 
And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Well, this pattern of going from bad to worse for the apostles culminates in a conclusion in verse 22. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Your text may say it is necessary to enter the kingdom through tribulations. That necessity is such that God's plan is not for us to escape hardship, but rather to suffer through it because of our faith in order to reach the end of our faith, our home in heaven with God. So this conclusion that Luke draws in Paul's teaching, we enter the kingdom through tribulation, is our theme for study this morning. The kingdom will advance through tribulation. Tribulation is not a word we use much. It simply means hardship, suffering, adverse circumstances, which could escalate into all-out persecution for the beliefs that we hold. The kingdom will advance through opposition to the gospel. That sounds like a paradox. The kingdom advancing with a gospel, and yet because of that gospel facing opposition. But that's the reality of our text. These men moved from place to place, and they continued to preach the gospel, verse 7 says, even though that gospel is being opposed. Now, this hardship can unfold unfold in, in degrees of severity. We just saw that in the text. From leave our city to threats, we'll stone you to we actually do stone you and leave you for dead. All of those degrees may be beyond what you face at present for being a Christian, but increasingly, your Christian beliefs and worldview will be challenged, will be strongly opposed, and even considered harmful, dangerous. As that unfolds in our lifetime, we should remember what Peter taught us in his first letter to the church. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The reality is that the church of Jesus Christ in the present age is not without harsh opposition and violent persecution. That may not be your story, but it is the story of the collective church of Jesus Christ. We should not be surprised in our day when we face opposition and hardship. Don't let it be said, as Peter indicates, that we thought this is, this is outrageous. We shouldn't have to put up with this. It's exactly the opposite. We should have expected it. So let's consider this morning the first part of this theme. The kingdom will advance. Oh, we'll get to the rest of it. The kingdom will advance through tribulation. For right now, just understand the kingdom will advance. And we see this truth in a couple of noteworthy statements in our text. Verse 1. They spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. Well, that sheds light on how they spoke. And not necessarily in the persuasiveness or the dynamic speaking, but in the message they relied on. 
Remember Paul saying in Romans 1, we're not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to save those who believe. So the way they spoke was about rescue. It was about deliverance. It was about Jesus, the rescuer and deliverer. And the way that they spoke brought about in these Jews and Greeks faith. They believed in great numbers, verse 1 tells us. Well, you heard the story. If we jump to the end of it, we read of them, the apostles now, backtracking through all these cities they visited, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. Those disciples, it tells us, were many. Verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples, they returned. Verse 23, and when they appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. There are those who have believed that have now been discipled. They are now the leadership in a church. The church is there. And finally, see in verse 26, they sail back to Antioch, the sending church, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. The mission is accomplished. The grace of God, which surrounded the work to which they were commended, had unfolded in the salvation of Jew and Gentile. A great number believed. They made many disciples. The work is fulfilled. So in a sermon about Christians facing hardship, we do well to remember Christ's words to his disciples in Matthew 16. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So as you see our culture degenerating, and you are seeing it, it bothers you what you see on the news. As you watch that news unfold day after day, when you are discouraged by the spiritual apathy in the very people you are praying for to be saved, it is then that you must pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And do it with confidence because his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The kingdom will advance. We must remember that in a sermon themed as the kingdom will advance through tribulation. Because we want to hear tribulation and immediately sound the alarms and think, what's that going to be and what's this going to be like and how much are we going to suffer? But the reality is it's the first part that makes all the difference. The kingdom will advance. That's the story of the book of Acts. That's the promise of Jesus. And yet, we must know from this text and others that your Christian witness may be met with opposition. Your very Christian presence in the workplace may become a problem. The kingdom will advance even though it may be, number two, through tribulation. Paul looked back on his travels and told this story of his tribulation in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. We have that in our text. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness 
danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. He unfolds for us, really, an adult lifetime of hardship, of opposition. Why? It's for the sake of the gospel. Does it mean that the path of spirituality must go through suffering? That we have to manufacture it if we're not experiencing it in order to be spiritual? Of course not. Monks in monasteries made that mistake and thought life has to be hard or it must not be the spiritual life. But that's not the case. Our text isn't saying that you should find hardship or invite hardship. The text is saying know that your Christian witness may face hardship. So this sermon isn't about cancer. It's not about other illnesses. It's not about death of a loved one and sorrow. It's not about that kind of suffering or hardship. This is about hardship because you are a Christian. This is about the opposition you will face in doing something really good, the highest good. It's what we're called to do, to witness to the saving power of Jesus Christ. The kingdom will advance, but through tribulation. And I want to take just a moment to look at how tribulation and hardship unfolds in our text. And it begins there with an indication in verse 1. The, ver the verse ends with a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed, verse 2, but, remember, word of contrast, something different's coming, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds. So two things are contrasted. One, the faith of some who heard this message. Others, who dug their heels in rejecting a savior, being offended that somebody would call them a sinner. They were confident in their own works of righteousness and were going to extinguish this message. A great number believed, but the unbelieving poisoned the minds of others. I want you to see first that truth divides. Truth divides. We see it in verse 4. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Some said, that gospel they're preaching is good news. Others said, that's ridiculous. That's an attack on everything we believe. That's offensive. And what we see is that the truth divides. Luke is writing this. Luke also wrote a narrative story describing Jesus being taken by Mary and Joseph as a week old baby to the temple. And they met an old man, Simeon, who had something to say. He blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Here's this happy baby dedication and some crazy old man waxes eloquent about swords dividing and thoughts and intents of the heart being revealed because of this divisive baby that he holds in his arms. The truth 
divides. Also in his first book, Luke tells us how Jesus warned his followers. Luke 12, verse 49, Do not think, or do you think, that I have come to give peace on earth? Question mark. Well, what's the answer? Well, we could answer yes and justify it. Of course he came to bring peace on earth. The prophet Isaiah called him the prince of peace. When Christmas rolls around, we hear peace everywhere because that was kind of that inauguration of this prince of peace coming to make us right with God, to bring peace through this good news of his salvation. But Jesus' point in Luke 12 when asking this question, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? He's asking, do you think this message that there is only one way to the Father. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Do you think that's going to make everyone happy and everyone will accept it? And the answer is a resounding no. And Jesus uses that answer. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, Jesus said. I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. And if you know anything of Christianity around the world, and even in your family, you know how a family reunion can be soured by talk of religion. Specifically, your faith in Jesus. Some of you have stood against your family's positions on abortion, against homosexuality. Some of you have spanked your children to the, to the shock and awe of grandparents, and how dare you do that? Some of you have tried to do what's right by the Bible and have had family members think, you've lost your mind, you must be in a cult. Hear Jesus' words. Do you think the gospel message of Jesus will sweetly bring unity everywhere? No, Jesus said, I came to divide if the truth is what divides. The truth divides. You will at times wish that it were not so. Your heart will break over the divisions between people you love, good friends and family. You will long for peace, and rightly so. But you need to recognize where the problem lies. It is not with you, at least it should not be, in your manner, in your lack of love. The problem must rest squarely on the truth. It is the truth that divides. Jesus divides. The old gospel song, It Is Finished, begins, there's a line that's been drawn through the ages, and on that line stands an old rugged cross. That picture of a cross, one in the middle and one on either side, one thief believing, the other scorning to his death, represents what we're seeing in our text. Jesus divides. That cross divides. You're on one side or the other. Those who believed in verse 1 and those poisoned and poisoning in verse 2. When you stand against the lies of evolution, when you stand against the lies of a woman's right to kill her child, when you stand against the lies of transgender ideology, it is then that you will see up close not only the reality of division, two sides, but secondly, the animosity of darkness. The animosity of darkness. Animosity is ironically a nice word for hatred. <laughs> All right? Animosity, a, a hostility that, that kind of stews and then erupts towards something. Verse 2. The unbelieving Jews stirred up Gentiles and poisoned their minds. That word poisoned was used of Herod, 
who laid violent hands on James and Peter. It's a hatred that is now finding expression. In John chapter 3, we read this. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. But the text doesn't stop there. That would be our first point. The reality of the gospel divides. There's two sides. But it doesn't just stay as two different perspectives. It graduates into war. John tells us, first of all, there is darkness and light. But then he goes on to say, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. The reality of division, that there is truth and error, that there is darkness and light, is not placid. It is not peaceful. Because darkness is waging war against the light. It hates the light. Which means, then, that this animosity of darkness leads to, number three, the threat of suffering. So we're not surprised that the poisoned minds that hate the truth in verses 1 and 2 leads to an attempt to stone them. And then ultimately in verse 19, the reality of stoning someone, dragging that bloody frame outside of the city and leaving it for dead. That's the account we have before us. Why is someone stoned with stones and left for dead? Because they said, Jesus saves. Your religion can't save you. Jesus can. And suffered violently for it. Stoning is typically, in, at least among the Jews, the punishment for blasphemy. Jesus was accused of blaspheming, and now the apostles have been in the early chapters of Acts, here they're being stoned on the basis of that charge. These unbelieving Jews are using the label of blasphemy for what the text calls preaching the gospel. So we're seeing a fulfillment here of what the prophets warned against. Warning Israel, don't call what is good evil. And don't call what is evil evil good. And we hear the prophets say that and said, man, things must have been really hard in Israel. But now we're seeing it unfold in the first century church, that proclaiming good news is actually called the opposite, blaspheming. How dare you say those kind of things or believe those kind of things? But I would ask you, are we not seeing this more and more in our society? where there used to be two opposing views. There's always been the Judeo-Christian way of thinking in American culture, and there has been in-the-closet sinful perspective. But then what was done in the darkness is now brought into the light, and not in a good way, not for cleansing. And now that darkness is waging war against the light. Listen to the news. See the headlines, how monogamous marriage is being labeled restrictive and detrimental. Being pro-life is labeled as an attack on women. Believing what God created in nature in male and female is bigoted and hateful. California now, including your view of gender, in the evaluation of which parent should get custody for a child. Because a view that would say my son is male or my daughter is female would be a strike against you in family court. Telling someone they've sinned against God that Jesus is the only way is arrogant, hateful, they're calling what is good evil. And if we're not careful, we're so afraid of that label that, that we backpedal on our message 
and now the only ones we talk about Christ with are those we gather to worship with. Nobody outside of us hears our message because we don't want to be hateful and bigoted, narrow-minded, cultish. Remember what Jesus said, if the world hated him, then the world will hate you. We've just never had to believe that for too many years. But two opposing kingdoms are at war. Kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. And in that war, there is hardship and suffering. But Peter tells us, our Savior suffered unjustly, and we are called to follow in his steps. Newton said it this way, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Let's finish by seeing in our text how the kingdom advances, even though we now know it advances through tribulation. The kingdom advances, number one, by means of God's witnesses. We can't miss that. The kingdom is advancing, but remember, every chapter is calling us back to how it's through the witness of God's people. It's through some that are gifted to preach and teach, vocationally, Paul and Barnabas and a few others, and it's through every believer, those that were called the many disciples that were left when those preaching apostles moved on. They were left to live out their faith there. And you'll live out your faith this week in Oak Grove, Grain Valley, and Blue Springs, and Lee Summit, and Kansas City, and Independence, and Buckner, and every other region you're coming from. God doesn't need a preaching apostle gifted to go there because he has Christians all over these places. You are the witnesses. And look in verse 3 at how this witness unfolds. They're speaking in verse 1 so that many believe. Then there's the opposition poisoning the minds against the brothers. And we have this word in verse 3, so they remained. It implies a reason for staying behind. We would think the text would read, they stirred up the unbelievers and poisoned their minds against them, so the apostles moved on. But that's not what it says. It says, the Gentiles and Jews poisoned their minds, so they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord. Simply recognize that you, your presence, your words, and your life out in the world this week may be the anti-venom against the poison of our culture. There's poison out there. In your workplace, in your neighborhood, your family gatherings, there may be all kinds of poisonous error, anti-God error. What's God going to do about it? He's going to have you in that family and in that workplace and in that neighborhood to be there, to speak what's true, to speak boldly for the Lord. These poisoned their minds, so our good guys decide to stay there and speak boldly. You're the antivenom. You're the great answer. You're the great hope. You're the preserving salt, Jesus said in Matthew 5. You're the ray of light. Now, understand there is virtue in verse 3 in remaining a long time. But know that there's also common sense in verses 5, 6, and 7 of moving on. The disciples weren't lacking courage when they moved on. I think God grants us some common sense to flee when they learned of this plan to stone them. They're not sticking around for that. They're not just signing up for abuse and possible death. So understand, when we talk about common sense in a Bible context, we can find it in the text. God's servants willing to face opposition and stay and speak boldly. But when it comes to throwing stones, common sense says put up a shield or get out of the way, and that's exactly what they do. 
Jesus had given them that permission, remember. The message isn't received, move on. There are other places to preach. Just a little nod to the common sense that Christians can have when filled with the Spirit. The kingdom will advance through tribulation by means of God's witnesses, by means of God's gospel, verse 7. They continued to preach the gospel. In verse 15, if you're not a Bible marker, I encourage you to make an exception. We have a five-word summary of the book of Acts in verse 15. There you read what the apostles said. We bring you good news. Men, why are you doing these things? They're talking to those that tried to call them the gods. We're just men of like nature. We bring you good news. That's your task this week. Take it to someone, to somewhere. Bring the good news. This is the kind of positive side of the text. It's yes, the kingdom will advance. That's good news. Through tribulation, that sounds hard. But keep coming back to the truth. It's good news. You get to tell it. You get to break the good news to someone. It's like engaged couples. Nathan and Holly, did you hear Michaela is also engaged? Michaela and Caleb out in Wyoming. They get to break that news. They leave their quiet spot of rings and mushy words, and they come back and break the news to someone. We're engaged. That's how the gospel is. It's supposed to be you get to do this. It's good news. That's the whole point of this story of this lame man being able to walk. We had seen that back in Acts chapter 3. Now we see it again. The kingdom will advance by God's witnesses, by God's gospel. Three, by God's power. The power of God on display and the healing of a lame man showing that the power of God can transform our lives. Some historical background here. They were called Zeus and Hermes by this crowd. Well, it's interesting. There's a legend that had been around long before Paul and Barnabas showed up to teach. It was this story of Zeus and Hermes who visited a valley just a few cities over from this location. They came to that valley in the form of human men. And they went house to house, knocking on the doors, looking for a reception, looking to be welcomed, and nobody invited them in until they got to this one poor couple, an elderly couple, and that couple let them in and shared their meager things with them. The next morning, the gods took that elderly couple up on the mountain and flooded the valley, killing all those people for not receiving the gods. That's an interesting historical record of how people thought in this region. And now two men show up and work a miracle. This lame man walks and they immediately default to, we don't want to get flooded in the valley because we didn't receive the gods. And they start praising these men as specific gods, Zeus and Hermes. Of course, the disciples reject that. They make it known that this miracle was designed to point them to the God who satisfies. You might say, well, no one's telling us we're gods these days. Well, I beg to differ. Since the Garden of Eden, you have been told you can be a god. And these days, it just seems all the easier with technology. We can, we can be information lords. We can control we can know. And if you add social media, we can be esteemed. Our culture is constantly marketing the idea of self. The way I feel. The way I see it. Well, what's true for me is, and all of this stuff just puts me at the center of the universe. Call me Zeus, please. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll get sucked into that. 
world of becoming our own God. So don't think this is a foreign idea. Pretty blatant for the apostles, pretty easy to shut down. A little more subtle perhaps for us to think somehow we're more than we really are. We think we can make things work out. We think we can talk our kids into being good. We think our witness should convert our friends. We think we can raise the lame man, and we can't. We are to come as witnesses relying on a much greater power. We are to go about our Christian lives this week in a much greater power than we can muster. So don't fall into this trap of doing things in our own strength. Remember, the kingdom advances only by the power of God. Verse 17, it advances by means of God's grace. In Paul's answer to these men, he says that God did not leave himself without a witness among the unbelieving world. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. You remember the expression from the Gospels, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We call this common grace. The goodness of God displayed to both believers and unbelievers alike. The kingdom of God is advancing through God's grace. Common grace shown to all. Helping them see that when they enjoy anything good, anything that satisfies, whether that be a, a large meal, a, a sexual relationship, a friendship, whatever God has designed as good and satisfying in this life is all but a glimpse of the reality that in Christ all of God's promises are fulfilled. Christ is enough. He alone satisfies. And every unbeliever will stand before God having, having received illustration after illustration after illustration of tasting goodness and being satisfied and yet never turning to the ultimate satisfaction of Jesus. God has left witnesses in the form of his goodness and his satisfaction and they are billboards that point us to Christ. Finally, see that God's kingdom advances through his church. The church is highlighted at the end of this text because it's reminding us this isn't about Paul and Barnabas. Acts isn't all about the superheroes of the faith. It's about how God got his church going. The apple of his eye. The church. You individually and with the local body are the voice of the good news, the display of God's transformational power. You are the sending agency of specific gospel tellers. You're the church. Brothers and sisters, our text this morning has made it clear the kingdom of God advances through tribulation. You may never find yourself on the bottom of a pile of stones like Paul did, coming to and realizing he's still alive. That may not be the opposition you face, but you will face some kind of opposition for your Christian faith. By the Spirit's help, having studied Acts 14, you should determine in your heart to say, come what may, the good news is too good to mute. I cannot be silent. So my desire is that this text would stir up in you a holy defiance of the darkness. A ready resolve to be the light and a bold witness to the truth that Jesus rescues, Jesus saves, Jesus satisfies. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that accounts for us the history of faithful witnesses May we be found faithful, having resolved that the gospel is ultimate in our lives. It is, by definition, good, and it must be shared. 
The battle will rage this week. We will be tempted to mute our passion for Christ, our stand for the truth. And we are asking that you would make us courageous in that moment to declare what is true and right, to declare what is the light that will pierce the darkness of blinded and poisoned minds. What a privilege is ours to love a lost world in this way. Ready us for that task and make us faithful, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we've come. But we're almost home. So take heart, Christians. Let's admonish one another with this simple song as we go.